Well, hey, good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? Good? All right. Good. Well, I'm excited to be here. My name's David. I'm on staff here at Frontline. And if you're joining us for the first time, or maybe last week was your first time joining, uh, we just want to say welcome. We're just really glad you're here. And uh, just to give you a little context of what we're studying today and where we're going, uh, we are in the middle of a series right now called Jesus Unfiltered, which you just saw the, the video for it. And here's what's really fun and really cool about this series uh, is we just felt like God was leading us as a church and as a zero collective, so Frontline and Center Church and Byron Center and New Life down in Wayland, to just go through the gospel of Mark and just track through the life of Jesus, answering some important questions like who was Jesus, what did he do, and why is it important? And so we're a couple weeks into this series. We started it the first Sunday of January, and uh, my goodness, we've just been so blown away by what God has shown and revealed and done, even through the life of our church, through small groups and retreats and whatnot. So we're excited. Uh, To jump in, though, I do want to ask you a question, and my question is this. Have you ever wondered why some things grow and why some things don't? Uh, my wife, uh, she's not a flowers girl. She doesn't like roses or carnations or daisies or anything like that. Um, she likes succulents. Do you all know what succulents are? So apparently they're like related to cactus or cacti or however you say it, but um, she loves these things and they're fun and it makes it really easy for me because she said the smaller the better, right? Is that a thing, ladies? Like it, the smaller it is, the cuter? I don't know. So whatever. So I go to the store and here's what's funny about our relationship or our marriage. Um, she she loves these, but she can't keep them alive. So we try really hard. And uh, personally, it's a problem that I like having in our house because I don't have to get creative on every major holiday or birthday because usually one's on its last leg. And I go, but look at this brand new one. This is perfect. Spend $4 at Meyer, and it's just her heart glows. She loves it. So we've just laughed because no matter what we do, it's like if you overwater it, it dies. If you underwater it, it dies. If it gets too much sunlight, it dies. If you look at it funny, it just wilts. Like it's just, you can't keep it alive if your life depended on it. And so there was once, um, it was like this last summer, we went on vacation, we were gone for a couple weeks, and Shannon's grandma actually stopped by our house, and so we got back, and she said, yeah, I took care of your succulent for you while we were gone. And I was like, oh man, well, that's going to finish that one off, because they're so temperamental. And we looked at it, and it was more alive than it had ever been. I mean, it was like full, and it was growing, and it was getting taller, and I'm like, oh, that, I got to get creative here on the next major holiday, and so it was, it was doing really well, and we're like, what, what, did, what did you do? And she's like, I just watered it. I, I, like, it was no big deal to her. We're like, well, we do that too, but it dies, and so anyway, this thing was growing, and now it's like, now it's fun. We're seeing how big it can get, and how tall it can grow, and we're, we're really enjoying it, so here's what happens, though. We invited Shan's little sister over, um, who's in high school. We had dinner together, and this is how I clean up after dinner. Um, you know, like the pot holders, like the cork round ones, and uh, I play ultimate frisbee when we're done. That's how I clear the table. I go by the frisbee, and I just launch that sucker as hard as I can into the kitchen. And so Mackenzie, Shan's little sister, was in there, and I threw it a little bit too hard, and it might have hit her in the face. Unconfirmed. She said it did. I didn't see it. But she said it hit her in the face. So she took this thing, picked it up, and threw it at me like a tomahawk. And with my reflexes, I dodged it. The succulent did not. And it chopped that thing in half. I didn't even realize it. And Shan goes over and she goes, what happened to this? I went, well, obviously I was not involved because I dodged it. Okay, that would be your sister right there. But here's the thing. I I tell you that story just to get into it, just to have fun. but, But really, if you get into it and plants and maybe even deeper, if we start going a little bit deeper, uh, do you ever wonder why some things grow and some things don't? Uh, Why do some plants grow and some not? Why do some people grow uh, in relationships with other people and some don't? Why do some people grow in their relationship with the Lord in Christianity and some people not? You ever wonder that? You ever look around at people in your life and kind of go, okay, I I can see what's above the ground. I'm kind of wondering what's under the ground. What don't I see? What causes some people to really grow and mature and thrive and others just kind of flail and flop? 
that's kind of where we're going today, and I'm really excited about it because we're going to be in Mark chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 1, and Jesus is traveling around, and he's teaching, and he's preaching, and he's healing, and he's performing miracles, and so a crowd is gathering, and a crowd is following him, and they just, they're hanging on every word, and they love what he does, and they love how he teaches, and how he speaks, and he speaks with authority, something that they weren't used to seeing, and so the crowd kind of gathers, and uh, what you need to know, there's two major industries, and Jesus uses these industries in Israel a lot to communicate truths about the kingdom. So the first industry is this, it's fishing. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. When Jesus came, he showed up on the shore and he looked at, uh, who was it? Simon and Andrew and James and John, right? He comes over and here's the four disciples and Jesus says, hey, why don't you come follow me? I will make you fishers of men. I'll invite you, come, I'm gonna take what you do and I'm gonna explain truths about what you do, your industry, your work, your career. I'm gonna explain these things in a way that you can understand them so that you understand my kingdom. So fishing is one of them, but here's the other one that's really important, farming. Right, it's a very agriculture-based society. And so Jesus, as he gets everybody on the shore, the crowns are following, Jesus is gonna use a different illustration. He's on the lake again, but he's using a different illustration to communicate some truths about God and about people. And I think there's a lot that we can learn that would actually address us in the room today as well as the crowd that was sitting and listening to him 2,000 years ago. So here's what we're gonna read. This is Mark chapter four, starting with verse one. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. Can I get an amen on that one for February 2nd? Amen. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. Greek is such a funny language sometimes, and oftentimes one word in Greek translates into a number of different words, and you use the context around it to figure out which one that they meant. And so this word that Mark uses for sure, he's kind of giving us like a foreshadowing. He's letting us know, hey, we're, we're diving into this a little bit deeper, and we're going a different direction, because this word shore uh, also means earth and dirt or soil. So he said people were sitting on the shore, they were sitting on the dirt at the water's edge and Jesus, he taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but because the soil was shallow, or but the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. What is the goal of a farmer? Right, not a, not a trick question. What's the goal of a farmer? He wants to yield a crop. You don't go out and sow seed because you're bored. You go out and you sow seed because you wanna eat. And you say, okay, I'm gonna scatter seed, I'm gonna plant seed, and so that hopefully in time and with good conditions, in a couple months, I can come back and I can actually gather, I can earn a living, I can provide for my family, I can feed myself, I can feed other people. So the farmer has a goal, and it's a pretty obvious goal. It isn't just to plant plants, it's to plant seeds that bear fruit, a harvest. So the goal of a farmer is to yield a harvest. Here's what Jesus says, Mark chapter four, verse nine. After he just unpacks this, he says, whoever has ears to hear, ears to hear, let him hear. Make sense? Confused? So is everyone, okay? So you're in good company. It's like, Jesus, where are you going with this? What are you talking about? Why is this important? What does this have to do with me? And why are you talking about ears now? Is this like ears of corn? Like we were just talking about farming, now we're talking about hearing. And here's the thing, here's, here's what's really important for us to understand, is Jesus is acknowledging that there's two different types, two different groups of people in the crowd. Those that are listening with their ears and those that are listening with their hearts. Jesus speaks in parables for a reason. We're gonna unpack why right now. Starting at verse 10. When he was alone, the 12, 
So the 12 disciples, these young men that Jesus tapped on the shoulder and invited them along, the 12 come up to him and the others around him and they asked him about the parables. Jesus, when you say these things and you tell these stories, we don't get it. It's just our, like, why do you do that? It's confusing. So they asked him about the parables. He, he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving. And ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. I'm just going to tell you, when I was studying this and digging into this this week, that is the verse that caused problems with me. I went, well, is, isn't the point that people would turn? Isn't the point that people would be forgiven? Jesus, don't you want that? Why does it seem like you don't want that? And what Jesus was doing was he was quoting this passage in Isaiah. And as he was unpacking it, what the heart of this passage meant is that there are some who come and they listen with their ears, but they're looking for something. In different pieces of scripture, it talks about itching ears. People who are looking to hear what they want to hear. They're looking for something specific. They're looking for something for them. They're looking for something that they can take that will make them better or their life better or somehow they can profit. It's them as an end goal. And Jesus says when they listen, they listen only with their ears and they're confused. But there's another group of people and it's the same group of people that came up after and they said, Jesus, we don't get it. We don't understand. And Jesus says to them, the kingdom of God, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Why? Because what are they listening with? They're hard. Jesus is saying those who listen with their heart, parables will reveal a secret. They'll be revealing. But to those who are listening with their ears, who just want something, who are using Jesus as a means to their own, those, those who listen for themselves, Jesus says the secret stays hidden. So it's with a heart that determines how you hear. And this is just about the parable by itself. We're gonna unpack the parable. Here's my, my plea for you. Would you not listen today with your ears, but listen with your heart? And would you say, Father, please reveal something to me that I need to hear from you today? Because I believe he has something for every single one of us if we would just seek him. Because this passage that was once problematic now comes to life and I go, oh, Jesus' heart all along is that people would be saved, that they would be forgiven, that they would seek him. But it starts in their hearts. So let's, let's unpack this one together. This is gonna be a fun day. Mark chapter four, starting in verse 10. It says this, the farmer sows the word. Jesus is explaining this to the disciples. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So as we read this, and as we maybe try to understand, you would go, why would there ever be seed on a path? Okay, so I wanted to illustrate this because you know I love my illustrations. So a farmer would walk out into the field, and we already talked about this. He would have a purpose. He wants to scatter seed, but they didn't have combines. They didn't have tractors. They didn't have big old trailers and seed spreaders. They didn't have that. You know what they had? Los Manos. They had some hands. So they would walk out into the field and they would do this. Facilities is going to shoot me for this. <laughs> this is how they would go out in the field. And they would take seed and they would scatter it and they would throw it. They would whip it with their wrist. And for this reason, as they throw it, it spreads out where? Everywhere. Do you know that it's true that there can be different types of soil in the same field? Oh. Wouldn't it be impossible if you walked around and went like this? That's good. Mm, some good over here. How long would that take you going through an entire field? Forever. So you know what they would do? They go, check, next section. That's how they would plant. This is a major industry. This is what they would do. This is the process of farming. So Jesus is saying, and he's unpacking and teaching his disciples, and he's saying some, some who hear the word, the farmer goes out to sow the seed, some who hear are like those on the path. They're like the soil. You know what the path is like? Another translation says the road. It's hard. It's 
hard to penetrate. It's hard to get in it. It, it stays very superficial and on the top and, and it's like concrete or it's like clay and it, you just can't get deep. It's good for driving on, but it's horrible for planting. Jesus said sometimes people hear and they hear like they're on the path and so the word comes and they hear it, but it just doesn't, it doesn't take root. It doesn't disappear. The local birds of the area fly by and they go, that's a buffet. We don't even have to try. It's just all laid out for us. Jesus said some in the kingdom of God are like this path soil. That they're hard. That they're not open and they're not receptive. And so they hear the word, but it just doesn't, it doesn't stick. Do you ever, I want to give you an example. Do you ever like say I'm on a diet and I'm not doing any more fast food? Or is that just a David thing? Every week, okay, all right, every day. I'm with you, every day. And uh, you ever do this? You go, okay, no fast food, we're done with this. McDonald's, sayonara, see you later, we're done. And 24 hours later, you're like, I have no idea, but I just ended up in the drive-thru. <laughs> it's like muscle memory, and then you look, and you're like, I'm gonna be smart, right? I'm gonna order a salad, because salads are good. And then you see it's $13, and you go, double cheese, medium fry. That's what I would like, please. <laughs> that would be great, because you can't have them separately, you need them together. Does this ever happen, or like, do you ever see this played out in the lives of people when it comes to faith? Do you ever have people in your life that you care about, that you really love and you trust, and they, they've struggled and come from hardship or sin or brokenness, and then they, you bring them to church, or you bring them to a conference, or they listen to a podcast or something, and they go, dude, that thing wrecked me. And you go, Really? Like in a good way, they, yeah, dude, I'm, I'm changing, this is it, it's a new day, it's a new page, and then 24 hours or 48 hours or one week goes by, and they're, they're right back where they started, or maybe even worse. That's what Jesus is getting at, and he's saying, that one type of soil, it just, it doesn't take. And it's sad. Are there people like that in our lives? Let me ask you a different question. Has that soil ever been you? As you just look at seasons and you go, I don't know what it was in me. It just, I was resistant or I was rebellious or I fought it. And Jesus is saying there's different types of people. There's different types of soil in the same crowd. And that's just one of them. Let's keep reading. Let's go on to the second one here. Second one's Mark 4 verse 16. Others like seeds sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. I like this rocky soil illustration that Jesus uses for the second type of soil. Uh, and it reminds me, my family lived in Midland. They still live in Midland. I was there for three years. And uh, I was going on a mission trip. We did a silent auction. And uh, we kind of auctioned off ourselves. And it kind of seems like slavery, now that I say that and look back. Um, but we would offer, like, we'll come work for you and do whatever. And so lucky me, a couple farmers went, hey, we can use him, big and strong. Come on over. And uh, I worked, and it wasn't fun, okay? It wasn't worth whatever they gave me for the trip, I guarantee you that. But then he called me a couple weeks later, and he said, hey, David, uh, me and a couple buddies, we're heading out into the field, his name's Clyde, we're heading out into the field, and uh, we're going to load up rocks. We got these big rocks, they tend to surface in the field, and so we're just wondering if you want to come out and walk alongside the trailer and then pick up all these super heavy rocks and put them on the trailer. And I went, there is no amount of money that you can pay me to go do that for you. That sounds horrible. I mean, it sounds back-breaking. I mean, you're just out, and you're just sweating profusely, and your back hurts, and you got, I mean, look at, that's not a light rock. We're not talking pebbles. We're talking boulders. And so I just went, no, no thanks. But, but here's the thing is Jesus talks about rocky soil, both small and large. Is it good to plant in rocky soil? For those of you that plant a garden or have a gravel driveway or something, do things grow well in the gravel? No. Why? What's so funny is because the rocks tend to bubble up to the surface, and here's what Jesus is saying, sometimes hardship is like rocks. They kind of come up, and, and there's big rocks, and there's little rocks, and then sometimes there's a lot in one area, and sometimes there's not. And, and it's kind of funny, but rocky soil prevents the seed from going deep with its roots. 
And so it stays towards the surface. It's still, it's going deeper. It's deeper than the path, but it's not quite as deep to make a difference. And so the sun comes out and the sun is so hot, it scorches the plant because the roots can't get deep enough for the water and the nutrients that it needs to survive. Jesus is saying there's a group of people like this that, that it doesn't go very deep. It just doesn't. And when trouble comes, or when persecution comes, or when the diagnosis comes, or, or whatever it is, and, and he adds the caveat, because of the word, they fall away. And I just picture like a storm that rolls in, and the waters rise, and the wind blows, and it does destruction on superficial plants. Jesus is saying there is a group of people that when hardship strikes because of the word old ways, old habits, old thinking, old relationships, old patterns win the day. And then there's a third type of soil. He goes to this one, he says in verse 18, still others like seeds sown among thorns hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in, say this with me, and choke. They choke the word, making it unfruitful. Can I just say this as someone who loves you and cares about you? We're in most danger of being this third soil. I think we as an American church, I think we in North America, I think we in the US, I think we with Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare and protections, and I, I think with everything, we have a lot, you guys. I think with everything that we've been given, we are in most danger of having the worries of this world. How will I pay for that? Where will I live? Who will I marry? Where will I go? What will I do? What if my life is down the line? All these worries, all these fears, all these anxieties, they bubble up to the surface and we just get scared and it says those, those anxieties and those fears and those worries of this life don't just affect the word and don't just affect the seed that has taken root, but it chokes it and it squeezes the life out of it. And then the second one, it says the deceitfulness of wealth. How many of you have ever been duped by wealth? You don't have to raise your hand. There's part of the reason why we're offering a financial peace university class. So often it's like when we go in, we see something that we like or something that we want or something that just, it makes us feel good or feel better. And we think, I just need more of that. I need one more. I need one bigger. If I only had that next truck or the next car or that next house or the next job or a bigger paycheck or that bonus, whatever it may be, we go, if only I just had that one more, just a little bit more. And here's what many of us are surprised by. And this is why it says the deceitfulness of wealth is the stuff that comes with that stuff we didn't anticipate, stuff we didn't expect, stuff we didn't have to think about until we did get it, and all of a sudden, how do I protect that thing, and how do I watch out for that thing, and now how do I pay for that thing and provide for that thing? And again, it says, so often, this type of stuff, the deceitfulness of wealth, the American dream, can choke out the word that God has sown in our heart. We are so in danger of that. And then the last thing, the desires for other things. We want so much. And here's the big issue that Jesus is describing about this third soil, this third group of people, is he said they want so much that they forget about the most important that in their desire to get more and to be more and to earn more and to have more and to store up more and to provide more, in their desire to do this, it so chokes out what I would love to do more of in them. You guys, we are so in danger of this. And the most important piece in this passage is the last three words, and it says, making it unfruitful. So the quality of soil is known to us based on what it produces, 
not based on the depths of the root, but what shows and what provides and what comes of it above the ground as a result. So when push comes to shove on entertainment, like the Super Bowl, or when push comes to to shove on giving, or on career, or on where to buy a house, what type of car, when, when push comes to shove, what wins? That's the heart of the third soil that Jesus is talking about. I wanna ask you the same question. Why does a farmer sow seed? To bear fruit. To bear fruit. The farmer so longs for and desires a crop to the point that that farmer goes out and takes that seed and scatters it 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 and hi Steve and scatters it and scatters it and scatters it in hopes of hitting as much of that soil as possible because the farmer desires to see a crop which gets us to this last part Mark 4 verse 20 Others like seed sown on good soil hear the word, they accept it, and then produce a crop. They produce fruit. They produce something of so much value that far exceeds what was originally sown. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was originally sown. Uh, You know, there are so many people in this room, there's four of them that come to my mind. Um, We're shooting some videos tomorrow evening for men's retreat. And uh, there's a couple individuals that I have asked who I know their stories. And I know how God is working in them. And I know some of them don't have a bow on the end. I know some of them are hard. Some of them are painful. Some of them aren't yet accomplished or done. But these four men are coming in to share their story. And what's common in all of them is there were people in their life that did that. That prayed for them. That prayed with them that pointed them to scripture, that unpacked the things of God, that talked about the kingdom, that provided for them, that wrote a check for them, that that drove them places, that housed them, that spoke words of encouragement. There are so many, every single story has people that just kept, they just kept sowing, just kept sowing, just kept sowing, over and over and over. And what's crazy is every one of these men that's gonna be on video has fruit all over the place fruit of joy and contentment, community, peace. Even bigger than that, though, of salvation, of freedom, and of liberation. Stories of life change. These are the same stories that we celebrated last week. We had 27 baptisms between Frontline, uh, Center Church, and New Life. 27 people, just an outward display of what God has been doing in them through the lives of people sitting in this room. This fourth type of soil is so important. And so if you're writing anything down, I want you to write this down. It's this. The quality of soil is determined by what it produces. Not how deep the roots are, not the location, not the presence of or lack of anything else in it. The quality of soil is determined by what it produces. So can I ask a better question? Because I think a lot of us, we have a temptation to say this. Uh, Which soil are you? And if we're honest in our hearts, so many of us go, I'm the good soil. Isn't that true? Right? You ever, uh, Hollywood is so smart about this. They make you the hero in the story. I was watching Iron Man, right? And you just, I, I feel like I'm Iron Man. I'm like, man, if I could just fly. It's, they make you feel like the hero. Well, oftentimes when we hear like, like parables or stories or scripture, we go, oh, I'm, I'm, of course I'm the good guy. Of course I'm the good soil. Of course I'm the one that's rich. But I was reading this thing earlier this week um, by a theologian, I'm blanking on his name right now, who said, you know, if we honestly get to the heart of it, the truth of the matter is none of us can say we, we are the good soil. Whoa. Then which one are we? Which one are we most in danger of? 
Our goal isn't to progress from the path to the rocks to the thorns. We, we don't want to do that. Here's a better question. What makes good soil? How can we cultivate that? How can we change our surroundings? How can we change our environment? How can we change our inputs? Entertainment and books and media and, and what we fill our minds with? How can we change our relationships? How, how can we change the conditions around us to add nutrients and depth and quality to our hearts? I think the best question is how can we become good soil? Because the quality of soil is, is and God is such a good God who says, I, I'm not interested in one for one. This is what's so cool about the invitation he gives us. I'm not looking for you to just reach one person and call it good. No, 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 I'm, I'm looking, what I wanna sow in you and the seeds in your heart, the fruit that that will bear won't just affect you, it'll affect your whole family, it'll affect your whole street and your whole school and your whole workplace, your whole retirement community. Yeah, everywhere, everywhere you go, there will be fruit and you'll look and you'll go, that's, that's at least 100 times what those that poured into me. And God said, exactly. Here's the truth of the kingdom and why God uses parables is there's so much richness in understanding who God has created us and called us to be. And part of our responsibility is to listen. Remember when he said that? He who has ears, listen. Not just with our ears, but with our hearts. I think the word listen in this passage is used nine or 11 times. And listen in the original language, is very closely tied to obedience. That there's one way to listen to mom and dad and say, yeah, 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 I hear what you're saying. Or like my son does, he just puts two fingers in his ears and just looks at you. I go, you're 15 months, we're in for a long road. <laughs> and it's a totally different way to listen when you say, I hear you and I will do what you're asking me. Here's what I think is next for our church. I think we celebrated 20 years last week and it was a great celebration and it was awesome seeing the life change put on display, but I think God's got so much more for us in the future. I have one goal today, one goal, and that is this, to send out farmers, to send out people who love the word, who love the Lord, who say, what he's done for me has changed everything. Therefore, I'm just gonna go out and wherever I can go, I'm just gonna scatter. Because it's changed everything. What's it look like to go to your schools, kids that are picked on, kids that are left out, whether you're a teacher or a faculty member or a student to say, hey, I care about you. What's it look like to go to the Super Bowl party later today? And you see the one who's not fitting in you see the one who doesn't know anything about sports that's wondering where the Patriots are? You say, hey, there's salvation for you too. What's it look like to look for the person on the outside who wasn't invited to something? And say, you belong here. What's the person who's sick and hurting and broken and they feel forgotten? You know how many people come and tell us, I just feel all alone. What's it look like for you to go, no matter what it takes, I'm with you. I'll cry with you. I'll pray with you. I'll pray for you. I'll go to doctor's appointments. I'll drive you, whatever. Do you realize that this type of sowing will change the world? I believe this is what God is calling us to as a church. There's a fire department right across the parking lot. There's all sorts of stores right behind us. There's neighborhoods all around us. There's downtown, there's the rural communities. Every single one of you has a field and a context to which you have been called for the purposes of eternity. And can I tell you a cheat? If you find good soil, just do that. Just load it. If you find something, you know what's so funny? I said this for service. Do you know what makes really, really good soil in farming? Poop. <laughs> write that one down. That'll be a fun note later. Manure. Excrement. 
death, decay. Let's change it. Brokenness, divorce, sickness, pain, loneliness. These are the things that prepare the richness of the soil for which God is intending to scatter seed. Can I just encourage you, as brothers, as sisters, as people who are older and people who are younger, students, men, women, all of them, we've been sent on a mission to go plant seeds for the kingdom. Can we do that together? Because lives hang in the balance. We can do this, and it starts with you. Father, we just come before you today. We're grateful for your word that you have sown and spoken in our hearts. Father, I know not everyone in this room is a follower of you. Some of us got dragged here. Some of us got invited for the first time. Some of us don't know what we're doing yet. Some of us have been doing this a long time. It just needed a refresher to remind us that this is the kind of God that you are, that scatters seed everywhere, whose heart is for people whose heart is for lost people and broken people and divorced people and sick people and lonely people, whose heart is for all people. And you leverage and use your church. You invite your church to be a part of the saving process. Father, I just pray right now that you would stir in the hearts of people a desire for those in their context, those in their families or communities, those that they meet on the street, those that they'll see later today, those that they can text, those where there's brokenness. God, the places that are just sick and deathly and ill, I pray that that's where you send us to bring seed, to pray, to share about who you are, to share about what you've done for us to let people into our brokenness and our sin and our shame so that they might see the redemptive power of Jesus. Father, we pray that you would leverage us as a church, that you would make us a pillar in our community, that lives could be transformed in this space because of the capital C Church, your people. Father, raise up farmers in this room. Equip them with your Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray that you would give us a context for which we can share and spread the saving news of Jesus this week. We love you, Father. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Everybody said together, amen.